Why do people want these cars? Is it a status thing? It more what took over us because I was in these difficult times in my life. The car was a distraction and it took me away from what was going on. Like I remember when I had my one series and I bought that purely as a project car. Every day after I finished uni, I had like a bunch of mods ready. I bought them all and I was like, today I'm going to do this. So I filled up my days modifying this car, but it wasn't for the purpose of status. It was purely for the purpose of like fake happiness. It's like people when they're depressed and they like do go on shopping sprees. They keep buying like clothes and going on shopping sprees to, to distract themselves. But then they like bought the stuff and it's not fixed any of their problems. So then what did they do? They go back out again and try to do it. And that's exactly what I was doing, but with the car. It was the most embarrassing day of my life. I was proper broke, like to the point I didn't have food. That was honestly the day. I was like, I can't live like this anymore. I need to sort myself out. Welcome to another episode of the Tai Camel Podcast, the number one platform for sharing stories worth telling. Today, we've got a special guest. We've got Bilal, aka DSG Demon. Welcome to the pod, bro. Thank you for having me, bro. Absolutely welcome, man. It's been a long time in the making. Yeah, it has been a good few months. We've been, we've been uh, trying to get this arranged. But we're finally here now. 100% man, glad you made it. So bro, look, you built a reputation of being one of the top go-to guys in Manchester for like high performance related cars. People go to you for information, advice. You've also got Demonize UK, which is a business of your own, which you started that a long time ago, but you're 26 years old right now for people that don't know. So we've got a lot to go into bro. And um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I was a car mod guy myself, right? So but doing my research on you, Next thing you know, bro, I'm looking at splitters. I'm looking at diffusers. <laughs> I want to get a starlight roof, bro. I'm like going the whole That's shit. That's what bang. it does, yeah. 100%. And I can see why people resonate with you, bro, because you're so like authentic and, you know, you're just you in it. Yeah, yeah. Always have been. Always will be. 100%. So I want to run it back. I want to yeah. run it back. Start from the very beginning. Talk to me, bro. Like, what's your childhood and upbringing like? So I wasn't from, say, the worst of families in terms of um, actual family background. I've come from a very good family in terms of morals, upbringing. Um, but just like so many people in around the world, we had our own family issues. We didn't have much financial backing. Um, my mum raised all three of us basically as a single parent. So for her, it was a big job. Through my younger years, because my sister's like 13 and 16 years older than me. so they were a bit more responsible to be able to look after me through my upbringing. And they actually pretty much raised me while my mum was out working to keep the house going. So like even to this day, uh, my sister's now got her own kids. And when she's shouting at her eldest, she still says Billy rather than Danny. To this day, and he's 13 now. Right, right. So like that shows you how, how much um, basically they raised me. Obviously my mum was there as much as she could be, but if she wasn't working, then she wouldn't be, there'd be no money in the house to keep the house going. So yeah, um, I mean, as far as I can remember, I can remember probably going back to the age of around seven, eight. And it was around eight years old when my, when my dad passed away as well. My mum and dad were already separated. So they were, she was already a single parent at that point. From the youngest things I remember, um, my mum would literally be sat on her bed counting 10, 5 peas to be able to go and get a loaf of bread from the shop. Literally, it's it's actually insane because I didn't, at that age, I didn't understand the value of money. So for me, it's just like she was counting change. But when I when I go back and think on that now, and you know, it, you have to be in a bad way, like where she's literally scraping together change to go and get to go and get a loaf of bread for us and stuff. At times, it was it was tough. Mm. Oh my mum, I can tell because now because I can understand everything that she that that was going on back then. I was too young too back then, uh, but now I look back on it, I I do truly because a lot of people who I've known my whole life they said your mum went through a lot raising you three, so now I truly do understand. But I think back then, obviously, I didn't. I was too young to understand. Too young to understand. Yeah. So it's not like a close knit family, sisters. Yeah, it's just me, me, two sisters, and my mum. Um, dad's never been like he's obviously it's been. 16 about 15 16 years now since he passed um, yeah so but prior to him passing away i'm sorry to tell you about that yeah. it's been 2008 right 2008 yeah 2008, he passed away um your mom and dad already separated at that time yeah 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 so did you feel a sense of responsibility to be like a bread owner i know you were quite young but like because obviously you're an entrepreneur now the thing is so they i think they actually split when i was around three or four so i was right. a i was still a baby at that point so i did at, at seven eight i'd didn't have that feeling. I think that feeling more came, I'll be honest, which on my part is a bit irresponsible. I think once I moved on from uni, which was only about three or four years ago, that's where it hit me like, 
my mum has spent her whole life. She's dedicated her whole life to me since I was born. And now it's my turn to take over, which may be a bit irresponsible of me because I really asked so late, but I did in the end. So like, what was your, like, what was the income source like? So you, was your mum working? Was she not working or? Yeah, so we, I was actually born in Liverpool. I wasn't even born in Manchester, so. Really? So yeah, yeah. So, so back then when I, when I was a baby, um, my mum used to work in Manchester. So she'd get the train down to Manchester every single day, five, to, five or six days a week. That's why my sisters would have to be around to make sure that I was looked after as well. And then eventually we did move here and she continued with the same job. She's always been in basically the Asian clothes industry. Right. So over 30 years, she's been doing that. She used to work for people. Like she worked for Farouk Fabrics on Women's Road. A lot of people know that place. They go back years. Um, and then eventually she set up her own business, doing it from home. And the way she did it was so that she could always be able to look after me while she did it. So that's why she's always done it from home. She's never had a shop. She's never had a store, like a, a concession in any store, any kind of her own shop, because she didn't want to basically neglect me. Uh, her priority was to put me through school, put me through college, get me through uni, because I'm the only, like I'm the only sibling that has gone through uni. Sound like an amazing person, man. Sound like she made a lot of sacrifices yeah. then. Yeah, she did, yeah. Yeah, and obviously, fast forward to like talk today, We'll we'll talk about it a bit later yeah. on. But you you bought your mum a car, innit? Yeah, a couple of, it was a couple of years ago now, yeah. I bought yeah. I bought her a car, yeah. That was a sick video, bro. Touching yeah. moment that. Yeah. It, it, uh, do you know what? It was just um I look back on it now and then I realise like how amazing it actually was. Um in the moment it's just your adrenaline's pumping. It's like I'm trying to keep a secret from my mum at the same time and then arranging it with my sisters and the rest of my family and just trying to get everything done and sorted and you don't actually realise what you're actually doing in the moment. But then now I look back on it. I'm actually glad I filmed it for that reason because otherwise I'd just have a memory in my head. But now, because I can actually go back and watch it sometimes and realise like, because then it takes me back to that time. But now I'm, I've not got that pressure on me that I had in the moment. Yeah, 100%. A lot of people want to be in that position where they can pay back their parents or loved ones, you get me? And it's quite fortunate you'd be able to do that. But so just to summarise, it was quite normal in the sense she had a good upbringing, but it was tough because you had a single mum. She was the breadwinner. You know, it might have been difficult at times seeing her, you know, putting the graft in. But I would imagine that's where some of your work ethic came from, seeing her as your hero in some yeah, ways, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. To this day, she's, she, I've told her, stop, she doesn't listen. Yeah. She's still, even now she just uses the excuse that she just does it otherwise she'll get bored yeah. like, as a hobby. But uh, I know deep down she's just, she, she's, I think the kind of business knack that I've got on me is, is a lot of it's come from her as well as my dad. So you were eight years old, going towards 11 years onwards. What what was like the next few years or how did that look like for you? Um, so between eight and 11, um, it was a bit of a, a bit of a tricky one. I do, I do remember, um, I'd got, I'd moved school basically um, because uh, I was getting racially abused in the, in the school. I was, I was in like a Catholic school that was just local to where we lived and I was getting racially abused in there. Is that um, Liverpool or Manchester? No, this now? is in Manchester now because I moved when I was three. So this is what, when I'm about eight, nine. Right, right. Um, and I've got ADHD. So I, I'm, at that age, I was quite hyperactive and not really in control of my emotions or my feelings or even my actions. Now I'm a lot more so. When, they were, when I was first being racially abused, I didn't truly understand how bad it was until I seen the kid get excluded for it. Right. And then I, I was to understand that it's, this is something serious, what he's, what he's been saying to me. What, what, what was the specific, not to say the word, but like what was... P-word, right, right. P-word, you dirty P-word. Really? Yeah, go back on the banana balls. I didn't understand, I was eight years old. I don't know where he's, where he's got it from, he's the same age as me. But yeah, he came back from exclusion and uh, he did it again one day. And this time it, it pissed me off. So I think one day we were, it was like school or playtime or whatever it was. And uh, he was out in the yard. And um, when I've pushed him, um, his head's gone into a fence, you know, with the, like the sharp ends. And it's yeah. like cut his head, like sliced his head. Yeah. Um, so at that point, obviously I had a, a meeting with the head teacher. And uh, they said to my mum that obviously we understand why I've done it. But I can't do that. So they gave me the option to basically leave or exclude me. They said, if you leave, there'll be nothing on your record. And you can just go to another school with a clean record. So obviously my mum took that option, moved me. And even the school I went to after that, I was the only Asian kid in there again. But there was nobody like that in there. 
What in Manchester? You're the only Asian kid in that school. In that school, yeah. Must have not heard of. That's the first. That's news to me. Honest bro. to God. When I was growing up, bro, it was hard to find a flipping there was, non-brown there was, person. There was about thirty kids in the class. There was me, one one color, and the rest were all white. Right, right, right. Crazy. And it was the, the yeah. There was only two Asians in the whole between year one and six. That's my sure yeah. that's going to impact you in some way going forward though in life. Yeah, it's probably made, made me a lot the way I am, the way I deal with like my business and. Um, like that's what a lot of people have said that they like about me that I'm not I don't like stereotyping but they, they say I don't deal with things sometimes as a typical Asian would and yeah. uh, I try to deal with it in a more professional way which is what people like about the way I go about myself sometimes going forward from there let's fast forward to let's say 18 onwards where did the whole I think you mentioned something about Jeremy Clarkson you've seen a review and that's where you got into the whole world of cars yeah th- that's th- that actually goes back to Eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. Is it? Yeah, because that, that was my whole Top Gear era. Um, obviously, as well as watching cartoons and everything, I loved Top Gear. Like just like any kid, all we would, all we would do is sit there and watch Top Gear all day, every day. And it was actually 2008, the same year my dad passed away. I think I was about like, 10 or 11 years old at that point. Is when that review came out of that C63, the one, the same one I ended up buying. That's that's when that car came out. That's when the review came out. And I just from that day, I don't know why, I just fell in love with that car. I think I think most kids did. But I'd fixed it in my head that I'm going to buy one of them. 100% one day I'm going to buy one of them. And I think from the age of like 16, 17, I was trying to get hold of one. So I was 16 in college and I went to Holy Cross in Bury. Um, there was a dealership there at the time just down the road called Boss Performance. And uh, I used to walk past there like a lock because um, it was near the college. And um, they had one in stock, a C63 for sale. I've seen it and I've just had this idea. At the time, I, I was following um, that Aleem, the Lord Aleem. Aleem. yeah, Lord Aleem, and uh, he was blowing up with all the all the rentals and stuff. So I had this idea, like, what if what if I buy one and start uh, hiring it out, and that get that way I get to own one without feeling the expense of it. This is me as a 16 year old kid thinking this, and then I've gone to my mum with this idea. She's never said no to me. She's always been ev- like, even if she because she doesn't want to upset me, so even if she knows whatever I'm saying is is BS, she'll hear me out or see what I have to say. So she said, all right, come on, let's go see the car. We've gone to the dealership. It's parked up there and we've run through all the figures and stuff. And then we've come home. She's like, right, tell me how you're going to make money with it then. Because she goes, I'm not paying I'm not paying to own it. So you tell me exactly how you're going to make it. And then um, I think at that point, I've like gone through the figures and I've had like a slight realisation moment. So I kind of backed off at that point. And then we fast forward to when I was 18, uh, 17, 18, I was about to start uni. And then I was basically looking at all the money I was getting from my student finance. So I was planning to, so I'd done like all the maths to basically, if I stay home, go to like a uni in Manchester, don't have to move out. Um, I could like save up this amount, buy this, buy the C63 and basically just own one cash paid within like two years. Uh, again, that didn't happen because I ended up not getting into any unis in Manchester. So I had to move out, I ended up going to Preston. Um, so that didn't happen either, but I'm actually glad because... At that time, I was still too young. I was being stupid and too young not to realise that I was just... All I was focused on was how am I going to buy the car. I wasn't thinking this is like a six-litre car. See, I'm 17, 18 years old. How am I going to insure it? How am I going to service it? Put fuel in it? All of this stuff, so... Yeah, we'll definitely go into detail about financing, stuff like yeah, that, yeah. Um, and what people need to look out for, because I know you're quite open about that stuff. A lot of yeah. people are a bit touchy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know yeah. why people are so scared to talk about it. But just to rewind a little bit back, so you made the proposal to your mum at 16, actually, Yeah. before you had a licence. Yeah, before I don't have a licence, because <laughs> yeah. I told her you can you can drive it, you can drive it, and we can even hire a chauffeur driver if you don't want to do the jobs. Yeah, 100%, and then you made a little proposal, business proposal, if yeah, you like. Yeah, basically, Saying, yeah. this is how we're going to do it, but you're already thinking about not yeah. in the mindset of a business owner, if you like. Random question that's coming into my mind, but it ties in. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or made? Born. Born. See, I disagree, but let me hear your let me hear your reason why. I only go off my own personal experience and people around me. So my dad was like, he owned multiple businesses. Like he owned about four or five restaurants in in um in Liverpool, there was one on Wimbledon Road that he actually owned that he named after me. Have you ever heard of Al Bilal? Yes, that was my dad's. Really? Yeah, he named it after me. Wow. Yeah, he ended up selling it, um, and now it's something. I think it's Moonlight now. I'm just splitting yeah, Moonlight yeah. and the Schwalmer place next door, but that that was my dad's place, and it was named after me. Wow. Yeah. If I if I had the money in time, I would have bought that place and kept it go or some way kept my name on that door. But yeah, um, and I don't know. 
I've just always had it in me because I've been, I've not just been in into like business and stuff since, since like that C63 thing. I was doing things at 12, 13 years old. I was selling, I was, I was making about 100 and 150 pound a day in school, selling crisps, selling crisps, Luke, selling crisps, Lucas aid. I was, I was basically had like, I'd run, I was running a whole thing where like there was like six, seven of us and we'd be like allocate. It wasn't just like, yo, go buy these things in the morning and just, just uh, sell them in school. We had a whole organized thing. Like you'll sell the Doritos, you'll sell the Kinders, you'll sell the Lucas aids. We had a whole thing every single day. We were making, easily making 150 pound a day going into school. Obviously at that time we were stupid. That's going sick into, money was, for it. It's going into school with like four, 500 pound jackets on, Burberry jackets, LV bags, and uh, teachers are looking at us like, where's this money coming from? Yeah. Obviously, the, the, when we got caught, we got caught eventually. You're not allowed to sell in school, so we got in a lot of trouble. But we'd made so much money at that point. We all blew it all. I don't think any of us saved any of it. So that's going back. I think this is going back to year nine. So year nine, you're what, 13? Yeah, yeah. 13. And then I think the same year, that summer, I'd stop make, I would couldn't make any money because it was summer holidays. Literally went to Barony Road with my mum. Found all this designer gear that they're selling. I went on eBay, started selling it. Me and my mate, two two of us did it. I think we made about five grand that summer. Wow. Yeah. Then PayPal realized I'm 16 years old, or under 16 years old. They banned, <laughs> they banned, I'm, I'm blocked for life off PayPal. Or oh, even to this day? To this day. Wow. Yeah. If I need to buy something through PayPal, I have to use my mum's. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? Because I was under 16 and the amount of money that I'd put, that like, I made, I don't know, they just that said a a lifetime back. Yeah, because I lied about being under 16. You're not allowed to have PayPal at that. Well, I don't know about now, but back then you were not allowed to have PayPal if you're under 16. So going back to the whole born versus made stuff, the reason why I say you kind of made, you, know, you had a Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so his sort of claim to fame in the early days was taking his dad's wine business from 3 million to, I think, generating like 50 million a year, right? Yeah. Something ridiculous, whatever the number is, right? But the, my argument is that, okay, cool. And he claims that, right, it's in my DNA. That's why I did it. Yeah. And my brother's, um, he's not an entrepreneur, hence why it's not in his DNA. But the way I look at it is like, okay, but you had a blueprint you had a blueprint to see your dad. You can role model what it takes see, to yeah, make. See, yeah, this is where it crosses a fire line. Do you see where it yeah, from? this is where, because the reason I say it is because anyone that I know around me, the way they are about in terms of if they want to go down the route of a nine to five life, or if they want to go down the route of being an entrepreneur, it's based on, it is based on their upbringing. So in a sense, it is made but it's also born because if it's being drilled into you from young, if that's all you see growing up, is that, is that born or is it made? That's that's what I ask. I see where you're coming from. That's yeah. that's okay. where I come with I, it. I agree with the crossover. Because I've seen it with I've seen it with my dad uh, through like my very young years, and then through my whole upbringing, all I've ever seen is my mum trying to make her own business work. I've never seen her go and work a nine to five. I've seen her at points be ready to give up. I've seen her do it two three times. She's like, I've done. I'm just gonna go at a nine to five. I can't do this anymore. She's gone for a week. She can't do it. She comes straight back. She goes, I'm going again. I'm going again. I'm going again. And it's just that kind of, uh, that mentality of just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. So I see it with some of my friends, their, their parents worked nine to fives. As much as they say they want to do like businesses and stuff, they, they can't get out of that nine to five life. And then I see my other people, like I've got a cousin and it's just in him, we know what he always He'll try a nine to five, can't do it, cannot do it. He's literally done it three, four, f five times. He can't do it. And then he'll go back, start another business, start another business. And I know one day he'll just, he'll hit the nail on the head and that'll be it. He'll be, he'll be done. So, and that comes from his dad as well. Yeah. His so he gets to same, witness that yeah. work ethic, right? Yeah. And like so yourself. So is it born or is it made? Yeah, true. That's, I think it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Yeah. yeah it's a bit of, it's when you think of it, can go yeah. either or. But it's interesting what you said about your mom. You, that was powerful actually, what you said there. About your mom, like you witnessed her not giving up, basically. I've seen her give up. Yeah. But then come back, but get back go, on again, the again. go again, go again, go again. But that definitely had an impact on you, bro. Come on. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it used to upset me because she'd come home near tears. And she'd be like, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Like, she'd be talking to me about like numbers and how, how we've not got the money to do X, Y, Z. Or, and she'd be like, if I just go and get a normal job, make X amount a month, it's secure money. I don't have to worry. I don't have to think, is a customer going to turn up today? Am I going to get any orders today? Blah, blah, blah. And it's secure. And then she'll go through with it. I remember her going and she just got a job because she's a qualified florist as well. She did that when I was younger. So she's gone and got a job at a florist's. I think she lasted a week. She came home, she goes, basically said, fuck this, I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm going mm. back to my thing. I can't do it. 
Yeah. So in that aspect, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's like you, you have to be. Yeah. And I'm me, me that seeing trait. that, me seeing that, and I've been, I've been through, before I hit demonized, I think I went through about five, six businesses. Not proper ones. This was the first proper, proper one, but five, six things I tried and to see if, th if they blew up. And through my own mistakes, really, every single business I did actually made me good money. I, they were like, to, to the level that I'd put them on, they were successful, but it was through my own mistakes that I couldn't make this something sustainable. Yeah. Um, but it's the trial and error that- It was the trial and error, yeah. That gets you yeah. to learn from your mistakes yeah. and eventually get one that just- Like the, the last one before demonized, the, before the social media thing, the last one was when I was living in Preston uh, for uni, I started my own um, mobile shisha business in Preston. And um, when you say mobile, what do you mean? So we delivered the shishas to people's homes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. I think loads of people are doing it now. It's proper popular now. So you'll just order it on like Instagram or whatever, and they'll just come deliver it to your door. 24 hours later, they'll come collect the shisha off you. It's not a bad idea, right? Yeah. I seen someone doing it in Blackburn. So I started to do it in Preston. I knew the guy as well. So I started doing it in Preston and it worked. It worked like a treat. It was a very good business. And then what happened was I went through a breakup in uni and it just, uh, sent me off the rails basically. And I just started blowing the money like Stuart. Cause I became free. I came like, it was like the shackles were off after like a four year relationship. So I just went crazy and just started spending so much money. I wasn't paying attention to it. And I just stopped caring about it. And eventually I just shut it down myself. Cause I just couldn't bother doing it. But yeah, that's basically what happened there. So we're at uni now basically, right? So uni, how old are you, how old are you at this point? 21? Um, at, this, at this exact point. Yeah. 21. 21. Yeah. So did you graduate? Yeah. What'd you graduate in? Accounting and finance. Has that helped you in your business, you reckon, or um, going forward? That's a proper nine to five job. Though. Yeah, it's helped me in terms <laughs> of being able to keep my own books because I'll be honest, the account I've got around isn't great. So sometimes I have to step in and do things. And if I obviously didn't have the degree, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a clue what I'm doing. But because I do, um, sometimes I'm able to step in and point my finger and say, look, you need to change this, change this, blah, blah, blah. So it has helped in that sense, but I'll never work a day of that job in my life. That unless, job, yeah. yeah, unless... I'm desperate. When you think of nine to five, you think of lawyers. Yeah. I can't. I can't do it. That kind of vibe. I can't it? do the office thing. <laughs> it's not me. Yeah. I don't want to brush over what you said about your relationship. I know no. you don't want to go into detail with that. That's yeah. fine. But where you're in a four, four year relationship. Yeah. You mentioned from, there. Yeah. From college. From college. Okay. So that cost off. I'm, I'm assuming obviously for the first few years, it was going fine. No. It was, it was a tricky one. It was a tricky one. Right. Um, so started in college, um, very early on, my mum came to know of it. She wasn't happy about it at all. Um, some words were exchanged and um, on my part, I should have known better. Um, I should have known that if someone's going to disrespect my mum, not to take it, but... Oh, sorry, I kind of missed that. Yeah. So, so you, okay, I get, get me yeah, saying so, 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 so there was words conflict. exchanged between, between her and my mum. When my mum came to know of, of the relationship and I don't know, um, sometimes you can really get sucked into a relationship. That's the thing. And um, I think that's what happened with me. Um, the girl I was with, she really knocked my self-esteem. Um, like I have pictures of me back then and you know, I wouldn't get a haircut for sometimes three months. Um, this is why you're in the relationship. In the relationship because really? I, don't know she, she, I don't know how, she, but she knocked my self-esteem. I think a lot of people will relate with this where a person makes you feel like nobody else will ever want you. So you don't have a choice but to stick with that person. So she made me feel like nobody else will want me. So my only option is to stick with her. And that proper knocks you down. You stop taking care of yourself. You stop caring how you look, blah, blah, blah. I remember, I, I remember I just, I used to just not care about my appearance. I didn't bother speaking to anyone. Um, I was a proper closed off person. I was like in my shell in a corner. I literally had no friends in uni besides my flatmates because that's kind of why when I was saying that I split up with her and the shackles came off, I just, I went crazy because that was my first time in uni being free. The whole time I'd been in uni, I'd been in a relationship. Um, and this was the first time I'm out in the open. I can talk to who I want. I can do what I want. I feel like myself again. Started going to the gym again after like four years, getting fit again. Um, and yeah, it's just like, I was so overwhelmed with the change within two weeks, like over a two week period, I just, um, I just went off the rails and just started spending so much money, buying expensive stuff, looking after myself again. But yeah, but back to more her. Um, was it like, cause people don't push you. People think, you know, relationship when they, your self-esteem goes down, it's not like a, a big 
like an action that happens. It's like and someone nudges you in that direction. It's slow little digs that accumulate over it is, time. It is. It's not one thing. So that's it's why not, people like it's can't not. relate to it. This it's is what not. you need to understand. It's not a. It's, it's compounding over time. So was it? What was it like? Was getting yourself esteem down? Was it like harsh words? Is it just nitpicking <sighs> or? This this is gonna. Be, I've never spoke about this before, except like only my closest close people know. But it wasn't just words. There was physical abuse in there as well. Um, not often, but it, it did happen. Um, and one thing with me is I won't retaliate ever on a woman because I've got, my family have got history with stuff like that. So it's one thing I'm strongly against. Um, but I never, ever, ever thought it'd be happening to me. So it was, as well as words, you know, digs, um, saying things to put you down, um, using situations against you mm. a lot. That was a that was a lot, like a very common one. Can you give me an example? Yeah, yeah. So many times, like, even those, like, the, the, the conversations with, like, my mum. I don't know how, but she, like, she, like, I'll be honest, at one point she, she swore, swore at my mum. Mm. And um, I should have been, I mean, I did step in at that point, I said, You've crossed the line. Crossed that, the line. That is not happening. Red flag. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I should have just, I just, I should have just cut it dead. But I was, I was trapped in that cycle, the brainwashing cycle. I put my hands up and say I made a mistake. But somehow she's flipped that situation on me to say, you know, why did you put me on the phone with her? I'm like, hang on a minute. It does not like my mum's because at that point, basically, my mum knew. She was like, you put me on the phone to her, or I'm going to her house. So I'm looking at. Two options, and I'm like, I've got to pick the better one here. Yeah. I thought she should be able to hold her own. Yeah, the but best you, out of two bad situations. Yeah, yeah, you need to, you need to just step up and be a bit responsible now. Like we've, we made, we've made this mistake. We both need to own it. I don't like the situation I'm in, but you're also in it. I thought she'd hold her own. No, the conversation's gone west, and uh, yeah, she's she swore at my mum. At this point, I, I, I was like, I flipped my lid. I, and in the moment, and she knew she was wrong. She had nothing to say. And um, later down the line, um, my mum ended up, did, did not send her up there anyway, to the house, the family house. She ended up going to yeah, the family yeah, house. Yeah, she ended up going anyway. She wasn't, she did both, even though yeah. she, I think maybe the swearing thing didn't help because she was like, oh, I didn't really get what I wanted from the combo. So she didn't end up going. And um, yeah, it got flipped on me. She was like, oh yeah, you, your mum's full of shit. She was going to do it anyway, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hang on. You swore at my mum. Yeah. What were you expecting to happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're both in this together. Don't turn this on. She's fully turned on me. She says, all because of you. It's all your fault. You're effing and jeffing this, that, saying, swearing at me, all of that. And all it's all me. It's all me. Just once um, we were in, because we went uni together as well. She got into a, a fight at uni with a girl. That gave her, like, something happened. It's, if words have been exchanged. She's ended up getting into a fight with this girl. She's been put on like suspension. She's um she's blamed me again. She goes, This is because of you. Because uh because she was giving you like a dodgy look and I didn't like it. I said I said, Well, if she's giving me a dodgy look, I should have been the one saying something. Why have you gone and said something to her? I said, I didn't say nothing. I said, People give me dodgy looks all the time, I don't care. That is actually a prime one of where she turned it on me. She goes, This is cause of you. I'm like in the shit now, I might get kicked out of uni because of you. And I said, I didn't tell you to go and do this. At the end of the day, just little things like that. That accumulate over yeah, time. Yeah, accumulate over time. And then they, the thing is, these kind of people, they use these situations for years as well. Like she's like, she, I think after that, she had like a permanent marker on her record. And then once I think she tried, she tried to get something and that thing that she did came up in the way and didn't let her do it. And again, yeah, that's because of you. You did that. Always bringing up the past. Always bringing it up. And then obviously they accumulated with new stuff. And then it's like, it's like a bloody judge. They've got a whole file together. Yeah. All these things you've did, yeah, I'm still with you. Who else would take that for you? And then you're like, then that's where the self-esteem gets knocked out. Yeah, maybe she's right. Because when you're getting told the same thing every day by one person, and then eventually you're like, maybe they're right. Because you're only hearing all this information from one source. Obviously, they've cut your, they've pretty much cut your communication to the outside world. So you're not hearing other, really hearing other opinions. Mm. Or they've like... I did have friends. It wasn't just like me and her. But even all my mates, like she had control over them. And um, like, even to the point where we split, my boys, my actual, who I thought, the guys I thought were my boys, they all left with her. No way, bro. Crazy, bro. I ended up with no one. I had no one. 
That's mad. mad. That was that's, that must have put you in a dark place, bro. It did. That's why I went off the rails. Yeah. That's why I went out just spending daft money trying to buy happiness, trying to buy friends. That's literally exactly what happened. And that's why, like, the whole shisha business thing just went, went to shit. So after that, you broke up, went for, off the rails, you mentioned. Shisha business went down the drain, blowing money. Right, you graduated. Where are you in terms of your headspace now? I'm over, I'm over everything that happened. Yeah. But that situation changed me for life like properly changed me for life in terms of I'm not the same person anymore that I was back then. I'm a lot less tolerant to people's to people's like nonsense now. And also I really used to struggle to let go of people. And um, now it's, I don't proudly admit it, but I've like, I didn't speak to my sister for a year. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sweat. But cause I'm not speaking to my sister. I wasn't seeing my nephews. I wasn't really seeing my nieces unless they were at my house and I don't know, that that situation really messed me up in terms of it's made me, if I need to be heartless, I can do it to anyone. If someone does me wrong, they go. And that that's the biggest thing it's done to me because I didn't used to be able to let people go. I would always try and fix things and make things work with either friends or relationships. Like I'm past it, but I'm just like, I think it's the way she played on my emotions knowing I was like in a vulnerable position. And um that's always like resonated with me and it's it's the one that truly made me like the person that i am today like the person that everyone knows on social media this person only came about after that nobody knew the old me except the people that are like in my life that you don't see on social my people in my private life that you don't know they know the old me but anyone else anyone on social media always met me through social media only knows the me after that i think that story you being vulnerable and being open and letting us know about that like you mentioned there that you're not told anyone about this and like people uh, watching your social media, they yeah. don't have a clue. Nobody about this. has a clue. Do you know what I mean? Because I've seen a total different perspective of you. I'm seeing this confident guy, takes care of himself, well groomed. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Not will I think for a second that all oh, this happened in your life. There was a day I just got up and I said, "Yo, we need to keep it moving. We need to get on." And it was something as small as that. I didn't think I'd I'd do everything I would I was I've done today just from me saying that that one day. And I feel like sometimes you just have to do that. You don't have to think, yo, I need to go from zero to 100 straight away. I went from zero, I went to 10, 20, 30. I'm not even now, I'm not at 100 for me. I'm nowhere near where I want to be. But a lot of people I know look up to me and they, they, they resonate with me, but no one knows this about me. It's because one day I was down in the dumps. Do you know the day, do you know the, the actual day I picked myself up and I sorted myself out? It was the most embarrassing day of my life. I was, I was um, proper broke. Prop like to the point I didn't have food on my table. I didn't have money for food when in uni. This? In uni, uni, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't speaking to my mum. Like we weren't getting along. I had no money at all. There was there was someone in my life at the time. She was like buying food for me and or cooking for me and stuff. Like that's how much money I didn't have. And then we were like, I was like talking with her about like the situations I was in and stuff like financially. And then I just said like it was the most embarrassing thing. They were like university basically offer you like an emergency loan. Um, it's like 250 quid. And I said to her, like, I think she suggested it to me that that's like an option for me to like get back on my feet. And like, I was really reluctant to doing it. And then I thought, at the time I just thought it's money. When you have no money, he's see money, someone offers you money. I thought, I'm just gonna try my luck. So I like, applied for it. And then I had to like go into the library to get it. I'm like, they're signing, they're like, you, you need to pay it back with the next amount. And I'm like, that was the lowest point, honest to God. I've never been so embarrassed in my life going into like the library and taking like a handout from the uni for 250 quid. I came back and that was like the, the lowest point. And that was honestly the day I was like, I can't live like this anymore. I need to sort myself out. And I literally took that money. I didn't even use it on myself. Um, I like, I had my camera equipment from like a few years ago. I needed to like buy a couple of things to like top it back up. I bought them, I still didn't have enough money. And then I sorted things out with my mum. She helped me a bit financially. I got all my gear together. And um, just to get myself back on my feet, um, I thought I don't have any like content to film, but I had content from the past. So I started editing, I started learning new editing techniques that I didn't do in the past. And I started making like new mock-ups of old videos started putting them back on social media, it blew up. Started reaching out to companies, I'll I'll do this for you for free, I'll do that for you for free. How many subscribers did you have at that point? 
At that point, less yeah. than 100. Okay. Yeah, less than 100. I had about, this is a, another page on Insta I've even got as well. And I use the same channel, but the thing is, YouTube's never been that good for like cinematics, cinematic videos. It's more for like, like gamers and like music videos and stuff like that. But for actual cinematography, that is what I did. It wasn't great. So even my videos, like my cinematography videos are still on my channel to this day but they have like, they'll probably have like a thousand views. Whereas I've got videos of me just talking about my golf art and it's got over a hundred thousand views. Yeah. So that's like the comparison. Um, so I realized very quickly, I'm not going to make money off YouTube doing this. So I need to go out and I need to get clients. I reached out to a couple of places. I'll do your, I'll do your thing for free. I will do your thing. I did Amari supercars free of charge. I did another place free of charge and just basically built myself up very quickly. All of a sudden I've got, place in Bradford that sells like their own brand of alloy wheels uh, they're called Riviera I got a contract with them um, to do every they, they offered like over 16 17 different sets of alloys at the time they said they want like a professional booth video making of every single one that was a big contract for me for a guy that's just taken wow. like, yeah, yeah, this is yeah. within two months of me having taken that 250 pound loan right okay I got it and all of a sudden I'm getting a contract so just to summarize, so you basically said, you know what, F it, I'm going all in now. Yeah. This is, I'm not, I'm not yeah. even like this. I'm still in uni at this point. I'm still in uni. Yeah. But you thought, you know what? I'm but I start. lived too much of an expensive lifestyle that yeah. wasn't going to allow me to just get by on a student loan. Yeah. That hand, that was a last draw for you. Yeah. That right. was it. Last draw. Yeah. That was like, it. Right. I'm, I'm getting out of this mess. Yeah. Right. And that was your driver. Literally that moment. That moment was your driver. That was the moment. You got up, because this is one of my questions I wanted to ask you, because uh, you did quite well in that sense. So you thought I'm going to be a social media agency, marketer, what, 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 what do you want to call it? Um, so it started, it didn't start with the whole social media thing. It started with me just doing what I knew, which was just making promotional videos for businesses. Got it. Um, and then what actually happened was I got, a the Perry, there was a place in Rochdale called Perry Chicken Shack and he reached out to me. He was like, I'm opening, he, they're originally from Berry, and he reached out to me, he said, I'm opening a new branch in Rochdale. I want to film a promotional video for that branch. But then he also said to me, I want you to run my Instagram account. So I don't know. I didn't know this was at this point, social media management wasn't really a thing. So I didn't really know what to charge him, but I just kind of did some figures that worked for me. And I was like, right, I can make your video and then I'll charge you this month to month. How much are you talking just to get an idea? Bro, at this point, I think I charged him 200 quid a month. 200 quid a month, yeah. decent. That yeah, so I was fair. posting for him four times. I was coming in once a month, doing like a photo shoot in one day. And then I was uh, just posting, posting for him four times a week. Right. So like every other day. And then I started doing that, got some little, it's very little, but some regular income. And then uh, the next one came in, I uh, heard from a, a car dealership. I went to basically view a car in uh, Southport. They came to know as well that I was a videographer and they were like, they offered me a contract to film every single car that they get into stock. And they're, they're going through maybe 10, 15 cars a month. So, it's, so all of a sudden I've, I've locked them in and theirs wasn't more on a social media base. They were just like on a contract basis, every single, they were needing me to film like a video or like a walk around of the car of every single car. So we're charging like, I think I was talking like 150, 200 pound a car, 15 cars. I'm making all of a sudden, I'm making over, way over a grand a month. Then the next one came, um, Lucky's in Oldham. Uh, I know I know him through family and uh, he was opening that for the first time. He just opened that place up, uh, he called me down and he was like, this particular building is like, no food place has ever worked for me. So I want to change that. There's some buildings, you know, like my Lahore ones, the road. Yes. That place just never worked before Lahore's. There's like three, four, five different spots there. Yeah. Every place failed. And then Lahore came and made it work. Smashed it. Yeah. This, he said the same story. This place, Lucky's, where Lucky's is in Oldham, he said, this is the same. Every food place that opens it is cursed. I want to, I want to remove that curse. We went through it and then I took a contract with him, um, doing like, again, four posts a week, two, two videos a month. And it, this time it was like six, 700 quid for that package. Wow. So I've got like 600 coming from there. And then I was like 200 from the other guy over a grand a month from the thingy, from the, uh, the the car guys. And then I locked in All Stars and Wimsler Road as well. I think I was charging them about 800 pound a month. So what, what, what year was this? This is 20, 2019. 2019. Four years ago. Right. Yeah, so all of a sudden, um, in my last year of uni, um, doing my studies, I've got four regular clients locked in as well as the, the odd jobs, the random odd jobs. Um, and I'm making like four grand, five grand a month in uni. And literally from that, that this is within, I'm not even lying to you because in January, 
is when I took that £250 loan. That August, I bought the Golf R. Yeah. Seven months, I went from being broke to like buying my Golf, like one one of my dream cars. And, and you're getting list. about five grand a month. Getting about five grand a month. And then, well, obviously, once you, a uni ended in May, then I started taking on even more work in the summer. And then when I went to buy the Golf R is when I met Shazan at ACG, who I've like had a, like a good uh, friendship with for like three years now. Right. Same thing. Um exact same thing like um he's seen the. i stopped working for the south the southport car dealership at that point and then okay. and then i told him like i showed him my videos i was like this is what i used to do there i started doing the exact same thing for him so i like retained that client because i'd moved home for the summer i couldn't keep going southport it's like over an hour away but then i'd retain i found a client in manchester doing the exact same thing with him so then the money i was making there i was like what if i start um doing up this car making this page for it and just see where it goes so because i enjoy it anyway I'm going to do it regardless. I might as well make content of it, see where it goes. So I've done all the, the standard mods. I've mapped the car, put the splitter on, put the body kit on, all of that. And then um, the, the steering wheel of my car was proper shiny. So I was just like, I need to fix this. So I knew of a company uh, called Royal Steering Wheels, very popular company. Um, and I knew they're like the go-to guys to like get like Alcantara steering wheels and stuff. So I've like sent them an email. And I'm like, what's the process? And they're like, option one, uh, you can come to us all the way out in London somewhere, change it over, and then you can come back. I wasn't willing to do that. Option two, send us send us your steering wheel. We'll work on it three, four weeks without a steering wheel, um, and then send you back, or we'll send you a loan steering wheel. I think there was a charge involved. And then option three was um, you can just buy a fully made steering wheel off us, and it was like five, six hundred pound. So I didn't like any of the three options, basically. So I was like, there's got to be a better alternative. There's got to be something. Started snooping around online, researching, oh, what's the alternative? And I found these covers. I found these, like, Alcantara covers or suede covers that basically, they go over your original steering wheel and you just stitch it on. So I, like, sports my mum. I'm like, mum, do you know how to stitch? She's like, of course I do. I've been in the clove game over 30 years. I was like, if I buy this thing, you reckon you could stitch it? She goes, I'll give it a go. I'm at this point now. We've, we fast forwarded. We're now we're in 2020, right? End of 2019, going into 2020. Covid's just hit. March is when Covid hit. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, this thing started getting serious in about March. Um, when Covid hit, I moved home from uni permanently. Then I'm like, all right, mum. I'm, I'm in my final exams in my final year of uni as well. So I was like, mum, I'm going to revise all day. Once I'm done, we can go out. We're going to try this thing. I've ordered this cover in. We've tried it, we sat there nine hours, sat in the car, trying to fit it on, make sure, I'm like, she, she doesn't know what she's doing. We've then called down like some professional stitcher who's been, he's like 70 years old. He's been stitching for 60 years. He stitched it, I wasn't happy. I was like, it just doesn't look right. Something doesn't look right. And the whole thing was that he was stitching it fine, but it was like the fitment in terms of how you make the corners sit and make it look like original. Cause it was just like stitched on, but it was just like a piece of cloth that was just stitched on. It wasn't like tucked under the trims or anything. That's what I wasn't happy with. And I didn't know cars in terms of modding them at the time. I didn't know how to lift up a trim, didn't know how to tuck something away or something like that. So I didn't understand any of these things. So we tried, we tried, we tried. My mom, me and my mom had a massive kick off me when she goes, keep making me go out and like it strains my hands and I don't know what I'm doing. You keep saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm telling you I know how to stitch something else. These covers aren't right. And then one day I figured it out, how to do it. And then we did it. This is like, we probably put in about 60, 70 hours of work at this point, sat in a car in the, in the middle of summer, through my exams as well, straining for my mom. I didn't like doing it, but I wanted to, see if we could nail this and at that day that was the day i was like happy i was like right it's perfect you finally got here yeah <clears throat> and then i looked at it like is this something i could sell so i like i put it on my story and i've got like i got like 60 70 80 messages straight away where'd really? you get that from where'd you get that from where'd you get it from i was like i could sell this i could actually sell this did you have a big following back then at this point, I had three, four, five k followers okay. on Instagram. Nothing, but I'm getting. But my my um, the thing is with my Insta, it's always been very high activity. Like even my like likes ratio to my following ratio is it's like ten percent, twelve percent. I think even Kim Kardashian gets like one, if that. 
if you look at her, she's got hundreds of millions of followers. <laughs> yeah. She might get a million likes. Her ratios, yeah. my ratio is really high. Got high engagement. Very, though. yeah. Like I, I get like, in, I've got like 35K followers, but I get like 10,000 story views. Right. Yes. My ratio is very high on that account. It's, I've got a very active following base, basically. So for, even for me, like, I was getting like 80 messages. I was like, I could just give them all the supplier. Or I, or, could, or I could start selling this. So I was like, it's not costing me nothing. Let's do it. So like, didn't put any money in. So hold on. Initially, it wasn't when you did it with your mom and stuff yeah. like that. It was in my mind. It wasn't even like... It was in my mind. Yeah, but you wasn't really thinking about selling no, it. Maybe. No, no. But main, the main reason I wanted it, I wanted it on my car. I wanted it in your yeah. car. And my, my mate wanted it on his car. Right. So I was like, let's get it on ours. And then we'll see what happens. But at that point, I put it up. And then I seen... Because the thing is, I hadn't seen the demand... And then I put it up and then I seen it. I was like, yo, I've got 3K followers. I've got 100 people wanting to order this already. I can't let this opportunity go. So I did it the smart way. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to carry on my social media stuff. I'm not putting any money into this. I'll, if they genuinely want to order, they can pay me up front. Carry on with your social media, meaning you're going to still get clients in, get money from I'm that. still going to carry on my social yeah, media yeah, management. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, yeah. managing management. all the food places, the car places. I'm going to carry on with that because that's that's what's paying my bills. This could just be a side thing. Um, and I'm not going to put money into it. If someone's serious about wanting this product, they can pay me up front. That's literally what I did. No, obviously people were funny at the start. I wasn't registered business. I didn't have a premises, nothing. But I was like, if you don't trust me, send me the money, bank transfer. I'll order the other product. Once it comes, you can come down to my house and we'll fit it. So you operate from home? Not operate from this time. I operate from my driveway. Really? Start of COVID as well. And this is where <laughs> you call it DSG accessories. Accessories, yeah. Got yeah. You. Yeah. So I was like, so obviously a lot of people were iffy. They were like, no, nah, I'm not sending you money. Online scam, blah, blah, blah. Then people, they messed out. The people who did trust me or people who knew me in the car game, they were like, gave me the benefit of the doubt, trusted me, took their money, and then I ordered the product. No cost to me. That money's already in my bank account at that point. So I've not had to invest anything. So I've taken first batch, 40, 50. I think I lost maybe like 30 guys because they didn't trust paying up front. So I think I've pulled like 40, 50 orders, first lot of covers, taken all the money, sat in my account, paid the order, whatever's left is profit. What are you charging for each one? At that point, I was charging, I think, 100 quid fitted. 100 quid? 100 quid fitted. And how much of hours of time did it take? At that point, yeah. it was taking us like three hours per wheel. Now I get it done within 40 minutes, 50 minutes. It's a lot quicker now. Um, actually, sometimes it takes us even longer, maybe sometimes four hours, five hours. We were really slow at that point learning. It was still, still very new to it. But yeah, it was good money regardless. It was COVID. People were struggling. It was complete financial uncertainty. Um, my mum's business, the clothes business, Everywhere's closed. There's no weddings. No one's going out. There's no parties. No one needs suits. So my mum's business at this exact moment has gone to complete shit. No one needs what she's got. So my mum's making nothing. My thing's still going, luckily, because the food game was booming through the all eat out to help out and take out. And people, the only thing people could do is go and get a takeout legally. Right. So luckily I kept my job in a sense. That was my job security that these guys kept me because um, they were still open for business and they were one of the only places people could actually go to legally. Um, so yeah, we started calling clients down, putting them on my driveway, um, doing um, four or five a day. Neighbors start getting proper pissed off. They're like, golf, like, cause, cause it's like one guy turns up in his golf R and he turns up with five of his boys with golf R's and they're driving up and down my, my residential street, popping and banging. It's a narrow, tight street. The sound echoes off the walls. Eventually, like, they started reporting us. We had to move. We moved to my mate's house. Started doing it there. They got reported over there. And we're, like, fast-forwarded, like, three, four, five months now, and I've, like, I've, like, made a lot of money. I've made, like, a lot of money at this point. And I'm, like, I don't know what to do. I need to do something, like... I want to treat myself like well, at this point I'm putting in like 20 hour days because like I was saying we're doing like four a day and it's uh, taking us like three to five hours each depending on the car and then after that I've got to deal with all the inquiries I've got to deal with the social media like putting posts up as well as 
I'm still working my other job, managing other businesses, social media accounts. So you're busy, busy, yeah. busy. Like I remember one of my one of my closest friends today. I remember a text that he sent me, and he goes, "We might as well not be mates because you're on your phone now, right now, posting shit on social media. Yet you're not texting. You've not texted me back for two weeks." And like that was the day I like I, I changed. I was like, I can't neglect my friends, no matter how focused I'm on making this work and making money. Um, I can't nail my friends, but I'll come to that later on. But at this point, I'm like, this ain't a side thing anymore. It's taken my life over. I've just finished my exams and my whole life has become this. 18, 16 to 18 hours a day, I'm outside in cars working. So clearly this ain't a side thing. Five, six, seven days a week at one point. So I was like, this is going to be my main thing. So slowly, one by one, I started telling the the, account, the clients, I can't manage your social media more anymore, I'm sorry. I had to let them go one by one. But I let them go in a way where I kind of managed, I seen what's the minimum will I make in a month from the other from the side business, the DXG accessories. Right, I'm making minimum X amount, so I can drop this guy. And then... Did the numbers. Yeah, did the numbers, and just one by one, I dropped them all off. Because it became a bit unfair, because I was so tired, I was falling asleep a lot as well. Sometimes I would forget to post for them guys, and it wasn't fair because then they weren't getting what they were paying for either. So it wasn't fair. And yeah, um, eventually they all got dropped off. Um, and now I'm like, this is this is it now. This is my business. I've just finished uni and it's just been like put into my hands. I've not had to put any money into it. It's set up itself. And all of a sudden I've got a load of money that I can invest. I'm like, what should I do? I'm like, I was still, I was 23 now. And I was like, it's time. I said to my mum, I'm buying the C63. So she was like, all right, you're going to sell the Golf R. I was like, yeah, I'll sell the Golf R. I'll buy the C63. How long did you have the Golf R for at this point? So I bought it in August and following August, I started looking for C63s. Right. Um, so a full year. Right, okay. So I was like, yeah, I'll sell the Golf R. I'll buy the C63. Started looking, wanted to find the right one look through loads because there's a lot of bad condition ones out there yeah yeah it's, it's like a it's like a bit of a, a a trophy it's a lot of people's trophy piece now as well so i wanted to find one like that someone's kept it as a garage queen i can go out and use it and enjoy it found one went well down with shazan from acg drove all the way down to essex i think it was west sussex actually it was car was perfect picked it up drove it back and i was like mum's like you've not sold the golf are yet you I bought the car at this point She's like, you not sold the Golf, are you? I was like, yeah, let me get this. I'll reveal it and then I'll sell it. And then um, bought the car, done the whole reveal. I've got my dream car there. And the moment for me was um, when we, the first day um, we got it, my mum came down to see it. And like, I put her in the, put her in the driver's seat and I was like telling her, look, it's got electric seats. And she's like playing with the electric seats on the door. And I was like, I've got a video on my phone. And I was like, right. I was like, rev it, rev it. And I was just sat there, I was like, Oh my god, I've done it! I've actually, I've actually bought my dream car, and then it like it doesn't end there because then I was like, then we've like bought the whole car, and then it's been like a week since I've owned it. I've still got my golf car, and she's like, she's like sat me down. She goes, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I'm keeping the golf car." She's like, "You can't afford to do that." I was like, "I can," and she didn't understand at this point how much money we were like making. Mm. She didn't understand, even though she was she was doing the business with me, by the way. Yeah, me, right, me okay. and her started this together. She was the yeah. stitcher. I was, I was the one like setting it up, making it, tucking all the corners in, making it neat. And she, and I was doing the social media stuff as well. And she was the one actually doing the stitch work because she knew how to stitch. But she, she clearly didn't understand the numbers because she thought I was, we were just making like pocket change. She was like, "There's no way you can afford both." And then like I showed her like the numbers and stuff, and I was like, "I could afford them like three times over." Or more and she could not believe it and at our point she was just like that must have been a proud moment yeah yeah and she was just like keep it she goes yeah. keep the golfer she goes if that's how it is keep it she goes enjoy it if you want both keep both um and like them next six months we couldn't keep operating from driveways and street corners um so I actually spoke to Shazan, who I bought, who I bought the cars from, and I was like, "Is there any chance we could start working with you at your unit? Just, just your car park. Don't need the inside of your unit. I just need 
a place that isn't a public street. So maybe like the car park, I can just do the cars there. And then like above his own office, he had like a, a waiting room. I said, if I can just put the customers in that waiting room while they wait. So they, they're not stood around on street corners or I'm telling them go town and come back later or I'm putting them in my house. I need some a space. And like we, he agreed, we made a deal. And then I was suddenly, I was in basically in his unit. I had his upstairs office. Um, I was using his car park to do my, the, my customers' cars. And then um, at that point, people started taking us a lot more seriously because even though I didn't have an official premises, all of a sudden I'm with someone reputable. I'm with a guy that's known. He's got an actual registered business, an actual place. And at that point, I think my sales like doubled, tripled straight away within like a month and a half. To leverage his reputation. Yeah. Collab with him. Yeah, collab with him. He got clout from me. I got clout from him. Win-win. I got a reputation in terms of I'm actually a legit person. I'm not just this guy scamming people online. Yeah. Just taking money, bank transfers and saying, yeah, yeah, come to my street. And at that point, I've got a premises of of some sort. So people fully believe me. Um, This isn't the demonized HQ, right? This is No, no, no. This is okay. No, this is before this. This is before this. Um, And then, yeah, it just, it just went crazy. That's when we went viral. Like viral, viral. What year was this? This is uh, still 20, this is still 2020. End of 2020. 20, still 2020. We're going into wow. 21. Okay. Going into 21. And then um, at this point, like we've started doing like the Starlight Roofs as well. Um, so we're like doing the steering wheel covers and the Starlight Roofs. We're only doing two things. Right. Okay. But we were packed every day. Every day I had like three, I had three stitches, I had two other staff doing the Starlight. Then there was me. Then there was my mum. It was like six, seven of us doing only two, offering only two services. It's crazy. And me and my mum were just battered. Like the hours we put in, like she would do the mornings. I, I'm not a morning person, so I can't get up at eight in the morning and go in every day. But she can't, she's up every day like that. She'd go and do the mornings. I'd go and do the evenings. She'd come in the evenings anyway, just because she was part of the business and she just loved being there. And she was battered. And, I, and then one day I sat down and I was like, I've treated myself. I'm living the life. I've got the C63, my dream car. Um, And I've still got my Golf R. I buy whatever I want. I do whatever I want. I eat what I want. I go where I want. And then I was like... It's it's time to get a mum something. It's not just me. She's like a lot older than me and she's putting in the same, if not more, graft than me. And just like the stitching for her, like I knew how much, like she started getting like like permanent pains in her hands from like pulling the stitches tight and stuff. Like, so she, she's put as much graft into this as me plus the fact that she's my mum she's worked a whole life to even get me to this point yeah all the struggles we've talked about already yeah she's been through all that to get me here she deserves something now absolutely one day um so that thought had crossed my mind but i was like what and then one day uh she was doing a steering wheel cover on a glc and she fell in love. I've never seen her love, fall in love with a car the way she was banging on about this GLC after she'd done it. So like, oh, I love that car so. She never. She spent. She's this. She did an Audi R8. She did bloody Range Rover. She did uh, Evokes, S3s, RS3s, everything. But the GLC was the she one. She didn't mention a word about any of these cars. But that GLC, she would not stop going on about it. And I was like, that's it. Like, that's the car. <laughs> So that was it. I went to Zan. I said, buy another car, a third one. I said, I'm keeping mine and I'm buying my mum a GLC. And we went and found at the time the highest spec GLC in the country. Like it's probably not got every single thing possible, but it's like got, I was like, it has to have everything. She's getting one. She's getting the, the best one that I can find. So I was like, she, I know she wants white. So it's going to be white. She's getting premium plus. She, I wanted to have, I wanted to have all the things that she's never had. Like she's at this point still driving our first car. So she basically, she had an A4 when I was 17 and she wanted to save money on the driving lessons for me. So she bought a Mark 6 Golf. Oh, bless her heart. She bought a Mark, she sold her A4 and bought a Mark 6 Golf to teach me and never changed the car after that. That that car's like infamous now. Everyone knows about that car. I've only just sold it to a close friend recently because I had no space for it. But it's still like, I see it every day, pretty much every other day. But yeah, where now I'm like 23, 24 now. And she's still got this car. She's like, I'm happy. It gets me from A to B. It's cheap. Cost me 400 quid a year to insure, whatever. And I'm like, no, enough is enough. Like we're getting you out of this car now. 
sort of found a car with electric seats, the master speakers, pan roof, reverse 360 cameras. It's got that bloody parking thing where you press the button and it parks for you. Everything, leather seats, heat seats. She's never had any of these things. That car had nothing, didn't even have a screen. Didn't even have rear electric windows, that yeah, car. Yeah. So she's got getting like complete change. So then I was like, we're surprising us. I've told my sisters about it. Um, I even like, um, I didn't want to be irresponsible with my money. So I gave any cash that I made and money I made, I gave it to my mum to mine for me because I don't want to be irresponsible with it. I was like, you just save it for me. So I was like, I can't even take the money off her. If I go and ask her for like five, 10 grand for a deposit, like for a deposit, she's like, you never asked me for this money. Why do you need it now? So I asked my sister. I was like, you give me it. Once we've surprised her, I'll give it you back. Sister agreed. It was all cool because she knew she knew I was good for it. So we did that, got the money, and managed to do the whole thing without a clocking on. And it nearly got ruined the day before because we're at work, and the car has turned up on a on a delivery truck while my mum is sat facing the gates. In the, she sat in the car facing the gates where the car's pulling in, and she's seen the, this GLC come on a truck. She didn't clock on it was for her. Yeah, she's seen the yeah, car. Yeah. She didn't realize it's seen for that her. in the video, yeah. the YouTube video. Yeah, she didn't. She didn't realize it was for her. Unbelievable. That could have been it. There ruined. So then we've like got like my, my sister and family together, gone out for a meal, and then uh, at Zooks, and then there's a car park, like an indoor car park next to Zooks, um, and then as we're walking back to the cars, um, Shazan's waiting in the car park with the car, and he's pulled through, put a bow on the front of the car, and pulled up, and she's at that point she's still not realised. The same car she's seen yesterday is now driving towards her with a bow on it. We've made this whole meal with some BS. It's like it's like the end of May, and if we do like my family, if we're gonna do like a birthday thing, we do it on the day, even if it's like a Tuesday, or whatever. We will do it on the day. This is like two weeks later, and we've made the excuse that this meal is for my sister's birthday. It was already sus, and then the cars pulled up, and she's still like, "What's this?" She's like, she's like, Hina, have you bought, Sad, you bought Hina a car? Like she said to my, something like that, like uh, to my brother-in-law, have you bought my sister a new car or something? Um, and she's still not clocked. And I was like, it's for you. And she's like, she didn't realize she's like not, not hit her. And then was like, explained it to her a bit and then made her sit in the driver's seat. And I think you see it in the video. That's when it just hit her. And she just started like crying. She started crying. I was like, you worked hard for it. This, this is this is you now. This is for you. Um, and yeah, she, she... Yeah, that was such an amazing moment. Yeah, bro. trust just, the yeah. family around. Because it took so long for it to, yeah. to register that moment. <laughs> it was genuine, oh, like, yeah. she was, like, shocked. She, yeah. like, wasn't speaking yeah, for like, ages. Yeah, like, I'm showing her things, like, look, this, uh, it's got an electric boot. She didn't even know that, yeah, like, yeah. She didn't even know that was a thing on and a car. she was sitting there in silence yeah. thinking, like, oh, I, can't, yeah. like, I can't believe yeah. it. And then uh, she could start getting, yeah, start yeah, getting yeah. crying. It was, a, it was a crazy, amazing moment. And then, um, yeah, I... Probably up there with like the best moments of my life. That yeah, like top top tier feeling. Hundred percent. Like I said earlier yeah. in the podcast, like everyone wants to do that at some point. Yeah, for their sort of 100%. loved ones, and the fact that you got to do that for someone that's been there f from yeah. day one with you, supporting you for the journey. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and we we started that business together. Yeah. It's only right that it's not just me that should reap the rewards of the business. She's she's worked her whole life for a moment like that, and I I don't intend to end it there either. Like. Got some things in the works at the moment that, inshallah, maybe in the next few months she'll be getting surprised again. By the time this podcast comes out, yeah, it'll probably already be done, so I can say that now. I've made a step back from the business. I wanted to enjoy her life now. I've completely taken her. I've taken over everything. I learned how to stitch myself. I've trained staff, and I've got the whole thing running without her now. Um, and I've fully taken over the business now because um, I just wanted to relax. It was causing her too much strain. Yeah. So now, obviously, you went from driveways to Shazana ACG Motors, shout yeah. out, and you got your own unit now. Yeah, yeah, so that, that was the next stage, actually. So shortly, it was, it was like a week after we got the GLC. Right. And um, we, we were in like talks about getting our own unit because we were doing, basically we were doing like the Starlight Roofs and we were doing them because like I said, Shazana's unit was always packed with stock. So we had to do the, we had to take like the roof liners out of the car outside and then put them back in the car outside, like not under a, under a roof basically. And like if it's raining, 
it was getting messy. Like, we're, like half our bodies like hanging out the car while we're like putting putting the car back together. And we're like getting soaked, or we can't do it, and stuff like that. So, like, we were in total. We're like, need a unit, really. Need a unit, really. Stunning unit, by the way. I'll oh, put some footage on the um, on the YouTube yeah. podcast episode, or whatever. Check it out, right? But like, we initially wanted to film in there yeah. for that very reason because yeah. yeah, it yeah. looks yeah, sick, we bro. Did, you yeah. did not spare. Like, it was yeah, proper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go into that like why as well. I was like to my mum, look, we've like we've just bought this not long ago we just bought the c63 like we're getting by we're getting, we're getting we've got a place it's not perfect but it's never our circumstances are never going to be perfect but now nah, she wasn't taking no for an answer um a place came up where we actually ended up now um she was like come on let's just go and see it you'd have to pay to go and see something i was just like all right let's go we've gone um gone and viewed it and like, mum just said, we'll take it. She said that without even consulting me. She said it to the to the guy, the estate agent. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, <laughs> oh, what are you doing? And she goes, you wanted to surprise me, I'll surprise you now. This is yours. And basically said, here's the keys. Wow. Congratulations. She just put it on me. She goes, right. She goes, you wanted a unit. You've got one now. And she goes, you ain't going to do it. She basically said to me, I know you. You weren't going to do it. You were going to keep hesitating. So now I'm forcing it on you. Go make it work. And I'd always said, I'd said to my mum, like, this is a, I'll, I'll give you a picture to put in the video. It was a plain white unit. Nothing, nothing that you see in there was in there. It was completely just bog standard. None of the flooring, the, even the suspended ceiling I've put in everything. But I always said, I don't want my place to be a unit. When you think of a unit, you think of a warehouse. I said, I don't want it to just be somewhere brings the car, get the work done and leave. They're going to leave with an impression. It's going to leave a mess. They're going to come and they're going to be like, wow, what is this place? Yeah. And even the, just like the name demonized, you don't think of cars unless you know the brand. You don't, you don't think of cars. So people's going to look at this. I want someone to look at my place and think, what on earth are they doing in there? What is that place? And I'm the laughing. That's exactly what I created to this day. People walk past locals around this in a residential area and they're just staring. This place is so bright. What is this place? Like black. They've got black, it's got blacked out everywhere, and then there's pink lights, there's blue lights. Then tube light looks yeah, yeah, and everyone's just to this day it's crazy. Like everyone just stares. Yeah. Like, what is this place? Every customer that comes, this is an amazing like if they're up near the like beautiful unit, martial I've not seen one as good as this. Or if it's like a, a Gora, they're like I love your unit. It's proper nice, proper clean. Like to me, it's like still not perfect, but I've just so caught up in work that I couldn't get to the point to to like finish it properly. But I know how hard you graft, man. Do you know how I know? Because when you were showing the how you were building it on YouTube, you said, "Look, we're not getting sleep. We're getting two hours sleep." So we bought a bed here. Yeah. Just in case we <laughs> to sleep. Bed, yeah. So I yeah. thought, right, yeah. this guy yeah, yeah. is a grafter. Yeah. So just... that, that's that's mad. So yeah, man. So from two fifty handout. 250 uni handout. Only for a short span of time, man was making five grand, 10 grand, whatever it was a month. Had to drop clients. Had to drop clients. Had to drop clients, right? <laughs> Lowest moment to pretty much the highest moment and you're only yeah. expanding, only getting bigger and better. Yeah. Isn't it? I, I don't think it ha gets, I don't think I've had a top of moment from the, the mum thing, from the car. The mom, yeah, like I've had more, I've had more. Actually. After that, I got the unit yeah. and I got like my 140, then I got my RS, this RS3. So I've had like other things since then, but I don't know. The mum thing I think was like the peak. Yeah. The C sixty three and the mum thing, they're like the, the peaks. So I'm looking for my next big accolade now. I did want to conclude with a topic though, because I know it's a common question that mm -hmm. I've got to ask you. Yeah. So I better ask it before it kind of slipped my mind. It's to do with the reality of owning high performance cars, bro. And it's a common question. You probably yep. get that through DMs yep. and stuff like that, bro. Every day. Every day. Every single day. And like I said early in the podcast, you're quite open about how you purchase your car. Yeah. Finance, right? Yeah. Like I said, I don't know why people are touchy about disclose that information but if you can afford the monthly payments exactly it's <laughs> exactly what, you know what i mean why what like i'll be i pay for about 450 a month for my rs3 right if i'm not making for minimum 450 a month mm. i can't i can't afford it so why why what was this whole joke oh your car's on finance sorry mate where's it where's your 15 grand deposit what are you driving i'm put i've put like 50 like 10 15 grand down i'm paying 450 a month I'm paying two and a half grand a year for my insurance. I take it 
awesome GTI for myself, pay like three, four hundred quid for a service. I'm fueling it every four days, hundred quid a tank. It's not just uh, finance. That car is, is probably costing me near a grand a month to run. You know what I mean? So I don't get why people get this some finance. I think what it is, a lot of people go broke trying to look rich. Mm. They can't really afford it, yeah. bro. So that's yeah. probably why. And they want to probably hide that kind of fact. I yeah. don't know. So let's break it down. Like, let's go with the Golf Mark 7, for example. Yeah. I actually got the cost breakdown for you here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So because it's a common car for a 20-something-year-old, yeah. one of the first high-performance car, if you like, entry yeah. level, if you want to call it that. So your Mark 7, was it? Something that you own still to this day, if I'm not yeah, mistaken? Yeah, yeah, still got it. Because people see their monthly payment, think, right, I can afford that. Yeah. Boom, sign the dotted line. Mm -hmm. Forget about insurance. Literally, I did this exact thing in uni. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> three times, three cars. So that's where people trip up. Maybe I that's why they're not... I, I did it three times. Three times? Three times. There I you go. I had to learn. It took me three times to learn. Your Mark 7 cost 20 grand. Mm -hmm. You put down 2,900 yep. deposit. Yeah. Borrowing 17,100. Yeah. And making a repayment, which what people see is the 325 yeah. PCP. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And they forget about everything else. They forget about everything else, yeah. So let's break it down quickly. So I've actually paid the car off now. I, yeah, paid, yeah, it of off, I yeah. paid it off like 18 months ago Right. in cash. So I don't even have the finance anymore, but I'll go through when I did own it. Go on. And what I was paying because, like I said, when I actually made that video, I was, very, I was still very clueless on actually running a, a car. That was my first performance car. I've learned so much since then in terms of like what where you should be servicing it, what parts you should be putting on it. So this is kind of be like more of an updated version. Cool. Um, Cause that car was mapped. So you should be mapping it at VW. It should be going to any basically tuning specialist to get mapped. Um, like the RS3 now is, is stage two. Who do you recommend your spec is it? Um, no, so for like the Golf R, you could take it to Awesome GTI. Okay. You could go to another place that I use in Warrington, like KWJ Performance. Like these are like VW VAD specialists. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. Because yeah they use like different parts and different oils when it's mapped like i got my rs3 done recently uh like two weeks ago and they've used like a special miller's racing oil vw won't or audi won't use that it's not much different in price you pay a bit more but and they still update your online history as audi would yeah but they're using parts and like oils and stuff that are specific to the tune of the car Oh, yeah. And you're adamant about getting it mapped. You need to get that car mapped. Yeah. Well, it came, this one came mapped, so oh, it wasn't like, it? yeah, yeah. But I was going to do it anyway. Just going to do it anyway, yeah. Otherwise, the car might feel a bit restricted. Yeah. yeah. Once the yeah. goal, well, the, the, going. The, the RS3 is like, they're 400 brake stock, so they're, they're fast. Okay. But the Golf R yeah. is 300 stock. And like, I've, I drive a lot of stock ones and they are, they're like, they feel slow to me now. Probably if you're fast to someone who's not driven something of that power before. Yeah. But just doing even a stage one, it completely just opens up the car. It's like they've got so many restrictions and limiters on them from stuff from factory. Just a stage one is like, I think it's like mandatory. So obviously I'm a newbie here. So yeah. stage one, what is that exhaust? What is it? What, what it's, are just, you? it's just a, a software flash. Oh, is that yeah, okay? So you can do the engine. So you can do the engine, which is ECU, or you can do the engine and the gearbox. So ECU and TCU. Okay. So like going rate from a reputable company, you're probably looking about 500 quid for just the engine. Um, and maybe like an extra 250 to 300 if you add the gearbox. Now, stage one, you don't have to do the gearbox. All the gearbox tune does is because the car's now running more power, more torque, it kind of updates it to, to have faster gear changes. For me, I, when I did it, I did do the gearbox and like the gear changes were so much more responsive and faster. Um, but you don't, it's not like mandatory. Um, optional. It's optional, but at stage two, it is mandatory. Okay. Because the car won't be able to handle, the, st the stock gearbox won't be able to handle the power of stage two. Okay, so that's just mods, yeah. which the sky's the limit when it comes yeah. to mods. Yeah. But, so we've talked about the monthly price for the car itself is 325. Yeah. Next thing to factor in is insurance. Yeah. You paid 550 deposit, I think it was. Yeah. With a monthly payment of 175. Yeah, that was at the time, so yeah. So combine that is 500 pound. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, bang five, on, bang on, five hundred. Yeah, five hundred pounds. That's just for the insurance, and that's just insurance. We're not, we're not even talked about fuel yet. No, we ain't talked about like servicing, yeah. which we'll yeah. get into in a second. Then you got road tax, which is about two forty for the year, one three two for six months. Yeah, right. Tires. I know you bang on about Comorans. Yeah, yeah. I you did. change your mind about now. You going to Taurus or something in it? 
Uh, no, I'm no. not. I'm not on Again, straight shifted to something uh, yeah, else. I'm on PS4 S's now. Back to PS4? Well, I'm back on PS4 you used S's to now. You them, didn't you? I did. Um, and then um, one day, the uh, Comorans, uh, Taurus, they're the same tyre. The right, sa- right. exact same tyre, just they've changed the name. Uh, yeah, one day they... Uh, Let you down. They nearly cost me a whole car. Really? Yeah, I was on a roundabout sending it, and uh, I don't know what happened. The car just lost it. Lost grip. Lost completely. Lost grip. Damn. Um, it's never like I've had. I've been in that car for like four years in August, and it's only happened once. But just that once put me off. All right. Um, How do you know it's down to the tire? Very much. I don't. Is. Okay. I don't for for certain. It could have been the car. Because if like that's another thing a lot of people don't understand about the Golf R and four wheel drive cars in general. Yeah, they're four wheel drive, but if you if you push them, they will bite. I think that's why so many get crashed. People think they are immortal in a Golf R, an S3, an RS3, an A45. You're not. If you push it, it will bite. Got it, man. So that okay. So that's about how much for tires? What we're looking at? PS4s. You get a punch and now boom. How much we're talking on the for? PS4s? Give us a both, so then people got a choice. Come to the Comorans, you're probably looking like a one or a tire, one fifty maybe max. Decent. Nah, we're not even one fifty. One or a tire. Right. I'd say one ten, one fifteen. PS4s. <laughs> I think it's about two. You got about two fifty. Yeah. To three hundred yeah, the yeah, tire. Yeah. The dope. Yeah. The dope. Yeah, man, I had a, I've got a Potenzas or something, Bridgestones, I can't remember. Yeah, Bridgestone Potenzas, I know. Oh, my it. God, bro, I had a nail in my tyre, right? Yeah. A nail, 240 quid for a tyre. Now, the guy I take it to, he said, look, it happened to me twice. The first time he repaired it, he goes, normally we shouldn't be repairing these. Yeah. Right, but since it's in the centre, I hit the side wall. Just put the plug thing in. We'll do it once. Yeah. But the second time, mate, you need to get it, you need to get it changed. And it happened the second time. And yeah. he goes, nah, mate, I'm not doing it, man. I'm putting your life at risk here. So it's quite a change. Yeah. 240 quid, man. So bear that in mind. Obviously, that's one tire. Um, then we got front brake pads and disc, mm-hmm. about 289 pounds. Yeah, that's stock. So yeah. since then, obviously, because I, I went stage two after that video, and right. uh, I ended up upgrading to like more upgraded brakes. So I think I ran. Frodo DS 2500 pads, which are like proper high performance racing pads. And the pads alone cost me like 220 quid. Wow. Yeah. There you go. So we're looking at a minimum of 289 pounds for the front. Yeah. Raise about minimum. Yeah. Uh, 254. Yeah. Okay. Fuel. This is madness, bro. You do 200 miles per week. I did. Right. That, did. That, that particular video, I was like, 250 miles. What are you doing, yeah, bro? Did, Where are you did. going, man? I used to drive so much. 65 miles. Oh, sorry. 65 pounds per week. Averaging about two hundred forty pound on the golf. So, but a lot of people I speak to, they're like, "Yo, I go for a tank every three days." Uh, yeah, I don't like. I don't know what they're doing. Like, they must be just sending it twenty four seven. Like, the fuel thing is so. It's obviously very dependent on where you, how much you're driving, and how you're driving it. But for the average guy, I've got to say now, for the average guy that's going to own a golf I just feel like they're just going to be sending it all the time. So I, I think you need to base your fuel on, number one, it's not 65 quid for a tank anymore. Fuel prices have rocketed since then. So you're probably looking about 80 quid for a tank now. And realistically, you're going to be tanking it every four days. Realistically? Yeah. yeah. Like so I, was, things. I was daily in the Golf R just to work and back for yeah. like a week and a half, um, just like a month ago. 80 quid a tank, four days. Normal work commute. Sending it about here and there. What, four days? Unless they've made the fuel different now that he drinks every four days. Because fuel <laughs> yeah. used to... I don't know if that car was drinking recently when I was driving it. Yeah. Not like it used to. Well, done. that's a major thing to keep in mind. So already you're looking at... It costs a lot higher than £500 a month. Common fault with the car is... I don't even know what this even is, bro. Uh, well, I'm not going to even pretend. Water pump. Haldex. Oh, the Haldex, yeah. So yeah. basically, it's the four-wheel drive system. Right. So... The Golf R, even though it's four-wheel drive, it's yeah. not. Right. It's front-wheel drive. And then they've got this Haldex system, which sends some power to the rear, which makes it four motion, basically. Well, what happens is, like, the, like, the filters or something, like, get clogged up, so you have to, like, get them serviced, basically, to, to, to clear all the pipes out or whatever, something like that. I'm not a mechanic, so I don't know the exact... But you basically have to get it serviced, just like you have to get any other part of the car serviced every now and then. I think it's, like, every 30,000 miles or something. I think it's, like... From like KWJ, it's like 250 quid to service that. Bang on. Yes. But that's every like 30k. 
Yeah, it's, it's not. Quid. It's not like every service. Yeah, so every thirty k, something yeah. to keep in mind, yeah. basically, yeah. isn't it? And then you have got the DSG service, That's oil the filter, gearbox. the gearbox you mentioned a bit yeah. earlier, isn't it? That's about every forty thousand miles. Every forty thousand miles, about one hundred forty nine quid. Yeah. yeah. Services, pretty self-explanatory. Really, if you go to main dealer, you're looking at what um, three hundred fifty quid. Yeah. And minor ones, two twenty. Yeah. But you 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 put recommendations potentially not if you want to go cheaper yeah. budget to go Halfords, which yeah. is about 199. Yeah, yeah. Have I put a water pump and thermostat housing in that list? That is the most common fault on a yeah. golf car. And it's about bang, about bang average, about 500 to 550 quid. So you need to put money aside. Like For emergency that, funds. That is, if that's not been done, <laughs> it's, it's coming up. It's coming up. 100%. Yeah. Every 99% of golf cars. Mine, I've had to do my own twice. Really? I'd done it. It yeah. came up as standard. I'd done it. And then the one that I don't, I bought, also went faulty. So I had to do it again. Unbelievable. So what are we looking at in terms of cost? 550 quid. 550. 550 with labour. Damn. Yeah. So basically the monthly, excluding mods and services, you're looking at a 700 pound now. So from 325, which we thought is initial mm -hmm. payment, mm -hmm. it's actually minimum doubled. by the way. Yeah, doubled. More than doubled. 700 pound. That's not even, like I said, including services. It's just pretty much putting petrol in there. Yeah. Can, like, and then... Every golf car owner wants to modify their car. Modify your car. Which You're is... going to buy one mod a month. What's that mod going to cost you? I'm going to buy a splitter this month. It's yeah. maxed in. I go on maxed website. 215 quid for a splitter. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I've spent 700 quid on the car. I bought one splitter this month. In 30 days, I bought one mod. 215 quid for the splitter. 30, 40 quid for in. I've spent 250. I've not spent 700 quid this month. I've spent 950 this month. And even though it's not a fixed monthly expense... It's in you. I want to buy a mod. It's a variable buy, yeah. expense, isn't it? It's a variable expense, but it comes up every month because you keep doing stuff yeah. to your car. So you're not spending three, two, five. You Unless you're going to live on a budget. Yeah. You're you not spending. probably want to put a thousand pound aside. Yeah. And a 20 something year old these days, if you get entry level job, 20K, do you really want to spend more than 70% of your wage on that? This is, a, this is what I did when I, I was, I was working a job in uni, making, uh, waking 300 quid a month. Because yeah. I just work Saturdays. And I got a car that was costing me 310 a month. A Clio RS, a yellow one. I got a car that was costing me more than what I made. And I just complete like financial disarray at I that point. you didn't even drive it because you couldn't afford the petrol. Somehow times. I survived. Yeah. I don't know how, but it's just the stupidest decision I've ever made. I don't know what. So let me ask you this then. This is actually the next logical question, really. So why do people want these cars? Like, I can't understand it because I'm not in that world, right? Don't get me wrong, I'm a bit older now. And I got I got a three series estate. I've got yeah. kids, cars. That's my market. Yeah. I'm not in the market for high performance cars. But you give me the breakdown. Why do you want it? Is it, is it like a status thing, a status symbol? What is it, bro, that pe drives people to have one of these cars? Mine started not from status. Uh, it <laughs> It kind of, it's a mixture. Yeah. So it, in in college, I was the first guy, first first guy to pass in my year. Well, one of the first guys, but I was the first guy to have a car and turn up at college with my car. It was a shit car, but it was a car. I was that guy. I did it. It was a Mark 6, it was the same golf, but I did it. I was that guy. So at that point, what is it? It's status. Yeah. Got a lot of fucking knobheads jealous of me at that point. I was like, stop bringing the car. I stopped bringing the car to college because people just put a on me and shit. So I stopped bringing the car to college. So I was like, right, I had the status, but clearly it was not for the right reason. So I cut it off at that point. And then later on the, down the line, when I bought like my one series and I bought my Sirocco, um, it wasn't about, as, as well as being status, it more what took over us because I was in these difficult times in my life. The car was a distraction. And it took me away from what was going on. Like, I remember when I had my one series, I bought that straight. I bought the one series straight after the breakup. And I bought that purely as a project car. Right. So every day after I finished uni, I had like a bunch of mods ready. I bought them all. And I was like, today I'm going to do this. So I filled up my days modifying this car because I was going through it. I was going through that that time in my life where I needed to be like doing something and focused on something. Otherwise I was just going to slip into a dark place, which I already was already in, but this kept me occupied for some of it. Um, so that stage of my life, all I was doing, like my whole life was about cars, but it wasn't for the purpose of status. It was purely for the purpose of like fake happiness, basically, because it's, the second I've like done the mod, 
oh, yeah, I look at it and then I'm like, that's it. Like the hap like I'm out of the moment then. I'm not f like I've done it and then I'm like back to reality. I'm like, all right, now I need to do something else again. It's like people when they're depressed and they like do, they go like go on shopping sprees. They keep buying like clothes and going on shopping sprees to, to distract themselves. But then they like bought the stuff and it's not fixed any of their problems. So then what did they do? They go back out again and try to do it. And that's exactly what I was doing, but with the car. Um, now I would probably say it's a mixture of like status and achievement because I've been that same kid that's been driving through Cheetah Mill in bangers. Um, I've been in there a foot walking up there, getting the tram to cheat getting the tram. And now I'm that same guy that will still turn up to my childhood chicken burger shop from going on foot to going with my mum, getting a tram there. And now I'm turning up in like 50 grand cars, 60 grand cars. So for me, it's like, it's a bit of a status slash so I'm proud of myself. Yeah. That. So it sort of symbolizes success for you. Yeah. Because I've not changed. I've not compromised who I am. I'll still go to that five pound chicken burger shop. I don't care. I just go now. I go like in nice clothes. I'll go in thingy. I've not changed my roots. I think a lot of people think that about me that I've like forgot about my roots. I'm in Cheetah Mill every single day. Like that's where I grew up. I'll go to the same chicken burger shops, speak to the same people. Everyone remembers me around there from when I was young and they're like surprised I came out all right because I was just such a messed up kid because I had I was a proper hyperactive kid with ADHD that they never thought I'd come out like normal. So for me, it is it is status, but it's status because I'm proud of who I've become. But it doesn't mean I've changed up. Like you, just yesterday, I put it on my story. I'm at the same, I was at GFC. It's a place on Cheetah World. I've been going there since I was like 10. Parked right outside in my RS3. I've gone inside, sat inside. I don't care about, go yeah, I'll go for a nice meal here and there. But I sat inside in like this, like a, a thousand pound jacket, thousand pound bag. I'm just sat there eating a chicken burger in the same shop. I don't care about all that stuff. It's just, yeah, it's kind of status, but I'm, it's because I'm proud of myself. Yeah, 100%. Now the symbolizing success, I totally can resonate with that. That's yeah. fine. The wicked, so yeah, so but yeah, but most people you would say they just most people is is, is status, status. It would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, status. yeah, yeah, status. just to like, but I would say a lot of people as well is like you see a lot of like TikToks and people like car pages and they're putting like depressed quotes up, they're making TikToks of their car, yeah, and relating it to like depressing situations, like yeah, they'll yeah. put like so. I think a lot of people are, are going through, and I speak to a lot, like, I've got a lot of like friends in like the car, car community, and like I always check in on them quite often, like, to see if they're all right because I know mentally a lot of people aren't there and the car is their way out that's so I've, interesting so i've been there i'm out of it now um but i know a lot of people that have a nice car and they like do all this car page and modding because it takes them away from reality so essentially what when you're promoting stuff on not you personally but when people are promoting stuff on social media and showing a certain lifestyle mm. Essentially, what you're saying from your answer is they're masking a deeper pain. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Even these like, even these like girls that are influencers, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They 100%. just cover it up with makeup and nice clothes. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. It's the exact same. Every industry is basically the same. It's just relatable to that industry. For cars, it's mods. For girls, it's makeup. You know what I mean? They're all ma everyone's masking something. Like, I've probably told you like. 25% of the stuff maybe that's happened in my life today. There's a whole 75% you still don't know about. And all that is like as combined to make me who I am today, the person you see on social media, the kind of, the kind of guy you can be dealing with when you come to my business, everything. Like if, if X, Y, Z didn't happen to me, I might be a completely different person, but you only know, you only see the end product. You've not seen what, what I've been through to get there. And it's the same with everyone else. Like I speak to someone and I'll never judge a book by its cover because I know, I, I know firsthand that someone can mask shit very well. So it's like, it's just like one of them things, just be kind because you don't truly, it's, it's a very common saying, it's cliche, but you don't know what someone's gone through or 100%, going through. hundred percent. And like, I would say probably the majority of the car game, even like the guys that act like gangsters and like they point out like quotes about gangster stuff, they're probably the ones hurting the most. Facts, like guys are so emotional. Like you know when it comes to like relationships and women, guys are, guys are way more emotionally affected than girls. For girls, it's easy. 
because they just go out, text one guy, they've got him. A guy has to graft to get a girl. Yeah. And when he's not mentally ready to do that, he's sat there on his own thinking about that one girl. Whereas a girl, get on a phone, follow five guys, suddenly they'll be in their DMs. They've got five conversations ongoing. They're occupied, their brain's occupied. It don't work like that for guys. So, like, I've been there and done all of that. And I've been in that exact position where I've seen my ex just getting any guy she wants just to piss me off. And uh, I'm there, like, alone, suffering. And most of it, most of it is, like, it's either family problems that people are going through or it's, like, relationship problems that people are going through. And they're just masking it with, with a car. That's mad, you know. That's an interesting observation. Just, um, I didn't think about it. I know that obviously people put on social media and the mask and deeper pain, but the car mod specifically, I thought it was just a passion. So they... many people. It's not all, but yeah, so course, yeah, many, yeah, yeah. so many people do. Cool, man, bro. I think I've hit everything that I wanted to talk about. It's been good. Really been, been, been good. deep. Really enjoyed it, bro. I love how open you were. Yeah. Thank you. And like... It's going to help a lot of people out there. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button, like the episode, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.